Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Japanese literature and culture. <laughs> Japanese literature and culture before 1600.、Um, I'm your host, your guide, your, I don't know, talent manager. Anyway, Nicholas Tyson.、Um, I haven't met most of you. I have a feeling that will continue to persist.、Um, so, before I get into today's two topics,、um, since Some of you don't seem to be reading any of my emails. I figured maybe if I stick it in the video, you'll actually watch it, but who knows? I'm just going to try and broadcast this. But quite a few of you have not accessed anything <laughs> yet.、Uh, you haven't done any of the assignments.、Um, I don't know what to tell you. Like when midterms roll around, I'm going to submit grades. And if your grade is a zero, I will submit a zero. There's even, a, there's even an exam this week, which is just more questions, but still, like, you've got to keep up on the assignments. It's a lot. And every week you put off, that just adds a lot more work to do later on. So, I want to tell you,、um, I'm pretty forgiving when it comes to turning stuff in on time, but at some point, I'm going to have to grade things and I'm going to have to submit grades. And if it's bad, I don't care. Sorry. That sounds pretty harsh, I imagine. But, you know, I can only give you so much leeway. Anyway,、uh, <laughs> off to the less depressing stuff. So, today we're going to be talking about two texts that are assigned this week、um, some selections from the Kojiki, which is a quote historical text. It's more mythographic than anything else, but it's a weird, it's a weird book.、Um, and then also the first major anthology of poetry in Japan, the Manyoshu, or the Collection of 10,000 Leaves, that will be in the second video this week. So, first, if I get the, the share, screen sharing done correctly, we're going to be talking about the Kojiki. So, here it is right here. This is how it's written in Japanese. So, sometimes this is read differently from Kojiki, but like they read it in a sort of more Japanese way, but I'm not going to tell you what that is because I think it's stupid.、Um, the Kojiki was it sort of took a long time <laughs> to, be, to be created. Um, it was finally actually, I should probably add this somewhere. Let's add this by a guy named Ono Yasuma. That O actually should be long,、um, but I'm not gonna try and open up the character map and do that right now.、Uh, it was compiled by Ono Yasuma for、um, Empress Genme. Uh, something like the Kojiki had been ori originally、uh, commissioned by Emperor Temmu.、Um, it was a weird, long, complicated process. Ultimately, what happened is there was this collection of like, oral reports and written records from various clans and like, prominent families that make up, made up the Japanese nation state at that time. And O no Yasumaro. Compiled them, wrote them down, and sort of created a coherent narrative out of them that he presented to the Empress Genmei in the year 712, which is why 712 is the year associated with its composition or with its final production.、Um, the language of the text is strange, <laughs> it's in Chinese. Uh, <laughs> I have it written here as Chinese. Yeah, I, I characterize this as Chinese with Japanese characteristics, which is sort of the, the fair way of saying not always great classical Chinese, plus quite a few things that actually are supposed to be read as Japanese.、Um, but, mostly but mostly it's in classical Chinese. So, to give you a sense of what this looks like, I have to share something different. So, let me stop this share for a second. Share this one. All right. So, this is、uh, a site with the original text of the, the Kojiki. It actually says that right up here. Here we have the preface. And for those of you who are Chinese speakers, many of you are, you'll notice that、uh, <laughs> it's very not <laughs> in Japanese. It, it, it looks very similar to, I mean, it's not similar to modern Chinese, it's classical Chinese、um, for the most part. But there are some oddities in it, particularly when it comes to the names of characters or names of like various mythological figures. So here we have you know, a list of descendants, and you say, like, next are or next become 
the you know next are the names of the god names or the names of the gods and then it lists names of a bunch of gods now all of these are actually supposed to be read as if they are japanese and so what's interesting is that so here's here's a very famous person in the text and he's followed by another very famous person uh, so this is and these characters are not actually being read for their meaning at all they're not they're not like names in in chinese uh they're purely being read for their phonetic value, for their sound. So you have E, and the, these are like Japanese representations of what would have been contemporary sounds in Chinese. So <laughs> um, if you're familiar with like how classical Chinese was pronounced in the central states during the Tang Dynasty, um, these readings are close to that, bearing in mind that certain speech sounds that exist in Chinese don't exist in Japanese. So this is e, za, na, gi. And then this one right here is not, is actually read as kami. So, so this is izanagi, and then you have to understand the no. Izanagi no kami. So the god, izanagi. And then you have izan, izana, I should probably highlight, izanami no kami. So here, this has to be read as Japanese, as kami. And in fact, in modern Japanese, this is read as kami. But for the most part, the text as told is just in classical Chinese. And so <clears throat> this bit right here is, we'll look at this in a second. This is the, the moment in the text when uh, Izanagi and Izanami stir the heavenly spear into the briny water and then the the water conge congeals into an island as it says right here becomes an island and so so this you know this is a good old-fashioned like classical chinese expression this is not <laughs> so this is so this is the the, ch the copular verb in chinese in modern chinese it's pronounced sh like Wosha, Wobaba, Wosha Nicholas. Uh, apologies for my pronunciation. Again, my Chinese is not great. Um, but this right here is read phonetically, and this is read as Shima or Jima. So you have, so right here, you have three different understandings. Just in this phrase right here, you have three different understandings of how Chinese is used in the text. So you have it used actually as Chinese as a phonetic representation, this is o, no, goro, o, no, goro. And then here we have shima or jima because it's in comb combination. So this whole thing right here is read as o, no, goro, jima. And, but this is only read phonetically, but this is actually read for its semantic value as well. So this is one of the things that makes the kojiki extremely complicated to read. Um, it's cool and it's, you know, interesting from like an intellectual standpoint, but God, is it hard? <laughs> All right. So we need to go back to this. All right. So that's what's up with the language. We are still only on item A. Um, the other thing that's really important to know about the Kojiki is its sort of political function. And so one of the things that, you know, when you guys read the text, you may be asking yourselves, okay, so this, this is a creation myth. And it is. It's a creation myth. The, the very beginning of the Kojiki um, begins with like how Japan was created. Just Japan. <laughs> the only thing this text is, so the gods, a, a subset of gods decided to specifically create Japan. That's it. That's, that's what, the, that's what the, the sort of the creation myth in this, in this text deals with. It just doesn't even acknowledge the existence of the rest of the world, despite the fact that it's written in a language that is not Japanese. So there's that. That's weird. Um, the Kojiki actually serves two primary social functions. Um, the, the major one, the big one, is this one right here. And that's that the text exists so as to justify the Yamato clan, the, the one that became the source of the, imperial, the, the Japanese imperial family, as the rulers of the nation. So it's a creation myth, but it's also sort of like a chronicle of a line of descent. It's intended to show how the modern Japanese imperial line literally descends from the gods. From like the beginning, from the beginning of the creation of Japan, when Japan was created, the people who created it, their descendants are the current imperial line. But it also form, uh, serves a secondary, although also very important social function. 
which so the the kojiki the myths in the kojiki and the various legends and stories are kind of a hodgepodge amalgam of a bunch of different legends and fabular stories from the various powerful clans and families in japan and so the idea here is that instead of just like bigging up the the yamato and you know what they did it also integrates all of the others into sort of the the fundamental the, the official myth of the creation of the country to show that they too serve an important purpose and to solidify their position within the existing order so this text is not just about telling cool stories cuz let's be frank the stories are kind of bonkers and i love them <laughs> but also to use the bonkers stories as a way to sort of like oh like you know that someone from your family says like i recognize that legendary story like i recognize that figure as someone from our family and that's part of the like like we are part of the fundamental uh, social fabric of this nation so now the it, usually the kojiki is talked about in terms of myth and mythology but the thing is so this this is a distinction we make nowadays we make a distinction nowadays between myths and history um this text does not make that distinction it is a meaningless distinction as far as these people are concerned primarily because well they just don't believe that they're different things um they may very well have believed that you know these things actually they probably did believe that these things this like stirring the heavenly spear into the sea actually did happen that this guy um yamato takeru literally did whip his sword around and cut all the grass that was burning around him like they believe that this stuff happened and so for them it is historiographic it is a chronicle in fact that's the that's the third character in the name of the book it is the old things chronicle this is a record this is considered this is not considered to be mythological it's considered to be factual that's why it's a record um and i want to focus on three well two pairs of characters and then one other central character in the text um the first we want to talk about are as i mentioned earlier those those two those two goofballs izanagi and izanami who are izanagi and izanami i need to turn off my spotify this is really annoying the crap out of me sometimes i like to listen to music while i record these and it's just not working today anyway so uh there i talked about in pre in previous weeks i talked a lot about the influence of buddhism and confucianism there is also a kind of taoist aspect to certain aspects of japanese society in this time um the primary one being sort of the fundamental dualism that exists in taoism which you know we in we Anglo speakers usually refer to as yin and yang or yin yang, um, which, you know, you guys come from East Asia, I imagine you are at least passingly familiar with these concepts. But for those of you who are not, um, so the, the yin principle is usually coded as feminine, also sometimes coded as darkness. It's associated with the moon, with passivity, with a whole bunch of other things. And the yang principle is usually associated with uh, masculinity, with the sun, with um, aggressiveness, and you know, go down the list of you know, stereotypical like macho crap. Um, but in like Taoist traditions, sort of the, the, the primal male-female interaction, the sort of like heteronormative like creation principle, is one in which sort of both are necessary, but the male is fundamentally dominant. And you even see that literally in the text. So let's take a look at page 16. Oh, okay, I gotta scroll way up. I was doing some reading before. So if you look at page 16 in your reading for today, which is way further up than I thought it was, okay. So here we get, you know, the cre so this was that bit that I was talking about earlier. So this was Onogoro, the self-congealing island. This, this phrase is sort of in um, interpolation on the part of the translator. It's just, it's just a translation of what Onogoro means. <clears throat> so here we see the sort of the, the male-female creation principle at work. Um, descending from the heaven. So he, well, actually, no, let's begin with the heavenly spear stuff. So they come on this floating bridge. And they have this jeweled spear, and it says here, lowering the jeweled spear, stirred, churning the brine with a resonating sound. And when they lifted it up, the brine dripping down from the tip of the spear piled up and became an island. 
Now, for those of you who are complete prudes, um, you may have not recognized this is an obvious sexual metaphor. The spear is a cephalic object. The brine dripping from the, the tip of the spear into the ocean. Oceans in this mythological tradition are coded female. So you have a, you have a spear, you have a, you have a penis essentially, you have a phallus dripping its brine or semen into the ocean, you know, the, the vast woman principle. And so here we have this like sexual, and, but the thing is like, so they're doing this together, but it's worth noting that what is primary is, is the male. And then this gets explored in, in the following paragraph. This is one of my favorite paragraphs in the, in the entire Kojiki. It's just bonkers. Descending from the heavens to this island, they erected a heavenly pillar in a spacious palace. At this time, Izanagi asked his spouse, Izanami, how is your body formed? Here's, <laughs> she replied, my body, formed though it be formed, has one place that is formed insufficiently. Then Izanagi said, my body, formed though it be formed, has one place that is formed to excess. Therefore, I would like to take that place in my body that is formed to excess and insert it into that place in your body that is formed insufficiently and give birth to the land. How would this be? Izanami replied, that would be good. Then Izanagi said, then let us, you and me, walk in a circle around this heavenly pillar, again, another phallic object, and meet and have conjugal intercourse. Now, it's interesting. So in, in this instance, they have to end up doing this again. And the reason why as the, the gods explained to them, is that you know, Izanami talked first. And so that's why they, she gave birth to a, to a leech. Uh, <laughs> uh, she gave birth to an island of foam. So all of like the, the, so the, the Yashima that I talked about in the very, very first um, video like, are things that Izanami herself gives birth to. And you see that you know, down here <laughs> next board, the double island of Yo. Yeah, so she's, she literally gives birth to Alaji and these various other islands. But that only works when, let's see, the heavenly deities there performed a great divination and said, because the woman spoke first, the outcome was not good. Descend once more and say it again. Then Izanagi said this time, then Izanagi says first, oh, how a good maiden, after his, him, his spouse says, oh, how a good lad. And then once they did it the right way with the man first, because it's all patriarchal BS, then she gives birth to the islands the way she is supposed to. But this whole process of giving birth to sort of the, to literally giving birth to Japan, this is literally what it's saying. Um, this doesn't go so well because next she gives birth to fire. And as a result of giving birth to fire, literally her vagina is burned and she falls, she becomes extremely sick. And in her sickness, she vomits out metal and she poops. She poops out clay. Um, then she urinates. Um, the goddess of irrigation, so rain, and the god of cultural creation, so crops, and together they, they create food. So <laughs> basically, um, in Izanami, as she's literally kind of dying and sort of like vomiting and pooping, shitting herself and peeing herself, gives birth to all of these other aspects of the land. And as a result of this, she ends up going to the land of Yomi, which we will talk about in a bit. Um, the, the Yomi part of the story, so Yomi, this is weird. Yomi is usually sort of associated with the Western concept of hell. It's not really a hell. It's, a, it's, more, like a, it's more like a cave. <laughs> it's more like a, a cave with a door. Um, and it's a, a place that, at least at this point in the, the cosmology, is still accessible. It later won't be because Izanagi puts a big rock in the way so that people, there's a separation between the, the land of Yomi and regular old reality place. He goes to, he wants, after she dies and she goes to Yomi, which is like, it goes to whatever it is that happens when you die. Um, Izanagi is sad and he wants to go see his wife um, there's this weird thing that happens where she says you know okay I'll come back out so give me a sec I got to get my stuff together come um, but don't come in and look at me and then he of course being an idiot can't isn't patient so this will be a recurring theme men are not patient in the Kojiki and he goes and sees his wife and she's covered in maggots and thunder like eight kinds of thunder and he just finds it gross as hell. And it says, upon seeing this, Izanagi became afraid and turned and fled. Then his spouse, Izanami, said, he has shamed me. 
Right away, she dispatched the hags of Yomi to pursue him, and he runs away. And as he runs away, he creates all sorts of things as a result of like taking the vine out of his hair that makes grapes. Uh, <laughs> then he pulls out the comb and flings it to the ground, and where he fling, flung the comb to the ground, that's how you get bamboo. There's a lot of sort of ideological stuff here, like this is how bamboo was created, this is how grapes were created. And you'll get a lot of this stuff. And eventually, Izanagi... So fine, okay, so finally his spouse, Izanami herself, came in pursuit of him. Then Izanagi picked up an enormous boulder, requiring the strength of, ten, of a thousand men to move and blocked the steep pass of Yomi. So this is the separation between, you know, the land of the dead or whatever afterlife these people imagine and the reality of their ordinary day-to-day -day lives. Now, this pattern of sort of like male lack of patience... Um, and then sort of the, the antagonism between men and like male and female deities. This is a pattern that repeats quite a bit in the Kojiki. Um, we will in fact see it again. And that's the point that I was trying to make here. Um, and so the other, but the other sort of the, the primary takeaway from this creation bit is to understand that, and so this goes back to sort of like the justification for things in Japan, like the, like earth magic, geomancy. Earth magic works, according to this principle, because Izanami gave birth to the land itself. The land itself is divine. It is a kind of kami, it is a kind of god. And so by like situating things properly within the land, you then sort of like invoke the power of the divine as well. So that's our first major pair, Izanagi and Izanami. In fact, I have a, I think I have a picture of them. So this is, yeah, this is um, a later image. This is from the 19th century. And so we have Izanami on the right here, and we, oh, sorry, on the left. And we have Izanagi on the right. Izanagi's carrying the heavenly spear, and you can even see the little droplets pouring into the sea that are going to form the first island, Onogoro, which some people actually think is a real place. It's not a real place, though. There is, no, there is actually no island called Onogoro-jima. It doesn't exist. Awaji does, you know, like the Yashima do, but anyway, it's associated with the island of Nushima. If you want to look it up, uh, Nushima, so N-U-S-H-I-M-A, Nushima. So our next major pairing that we get is Mr. Manly Rage himself, Susanoo, uh, and Shiny Heaven. These are actually their names. So Sus Susanoo. So Susa, like ragey or fiery or aggressive. So, <laughs> and then no, the connective part, or the connective particle, ol. Ol here is just dude, man. So he is the ragey man. So it's like the ragey man god and Amaterasu. So Ama, so that's um, heaven. It's the sky. Well, heaven, literally. And then Terasu, Terasu means to shine or to shine forth. So she is shiny heaven. We got... Uh, raging Guy and Shiny Heaven. So at that time, Raging Guy said, in that case, before I go, I'll take my leave of the great deity, Shiny Heaven. When he said it to the heavens, all the mountains and rivers roar. So the, the dude, okay, so the first thing you have to understand about Susanol is that he is a jackass. Um, he does all sorts of really terrible stuff and he kind of ruins everything. And there is this bit here where, where I have to find this, when he sort of, so many aspects of this are, are bonkers. Okay, so Amaterasu is in the heavenly weaving house and Susano totally barges in. This is after they've, like, he's born all these weird children by himself and Amaterasu is getting a little jealous. Then Susano said to Amaterasu, so this is starting here, it's this paragraph. This paragraph, again, one of the most bonkers things in the entire text. He says, It was because my intentions were pure and clear that in the children I begot I obtained graceful maidens. By this, it is obvious that I have won because they had this like God birthing contest. Thus saying, he raged with victory because that's, that's who he is. <laughs> Breaking down the ridges of Amaterasu's rice patties and filling up the dishes, ditches. So Amaterasu is a very benevolent goddess. She's like trying to help people out. She's trying to create agriculture. She's trying to like you know, and the sun shines down and makes things grow, and that's good. But Susano is a dick. <laughs> also, he defecated, <laughs> so he poops, and he strewed his feces about in the hall where the first fruits were tasted. So imagine this, like, 
your 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 god, your minor god. You've just brought in the harvest. You've got peach. You got heavenly peaches, and you got heavenly apples, and you got heavenly kumquats. Maybe you even have like some heavenly loquats, and you have some heavenly I don't know, gold bowl, which is burdock. And you're like, wow, this is going to be so great. And just as you're about to um, taste everything, see how delicious it is, um, Ragey Man himself comes in and poops on it all. <laughs> Even though he did this, Amaterasu did not, so Shiny Heaven did not reprove him, but said, what appears to be feces must be what my brother has vomited and strewn about while drunk. Also, as to his breaking down the ridges of the rice paddies and filling up the ditches, my brother must have done so because he felt land was being wasted. So this is... Once again, women giving uh, men much more than just the benefit of the doubt. Even though she spoke this way, hoping for a remedy, his misdeeds did not cease, but became even more flagrant. Oh boy, <laughs> more flagrant than flinging your poop everywhere? Ugh. When Amaterasu was inside uh, the sacred weaving hall, seeing to the weaving of the divine garments, this is the part, what I was alluding to earlier, he opened a hole in the roof of the weaving hall. So, he, so, so this is a giant, we, have that giant heavenly weaving hall, and he rips a hole open in the roof. And what does he toss in? He dropped into it the heavenly dabbled horse. Oh, a heavenly dabbled horse, which he had skinned backward. He takes a, a divine horse that he skinned, that he flayed, and he chucks it in. The heavenly weaving maiden, shocked at the sight, and this is, it just keeps getting more bonkers, struck her genitals against the shuttle and died. Now Amaterasu, seeing this, became afraid and opening the door of the heavenly rock cave, went in and shut herself inside. So she, so she is rightly scared of this guy. This guy is psycho. Like Susano is a psycho. <laughs> and so being very rightly scared of him, uh, she hides herself in a cave. And this is one of the most famous episodes in the entire text. So here we have, this is, this is also, um, this is a triptych from the, the 19th century. Here we see Amaterasu in the center here, and she's inside the cave. And here we see Susano. He's pulling back the rock. Um, in the story, as you guys will read, uh, or maybe recall if you're watching this after you read, technically he only like cracked it a little bit so that she could see out. And so then over here you see the divine mirror in which, okay, so how does the story play out? So she hides herself in the cave. But because she is literally the sun, this is bad. It causes all the crops in the world to, to, to wither. Um, and she knows this, and she's trying to punish everyone because somebody's got to keep Susanol in check. So the other heavenly deities get together, and they're like, okay, so how are, how are we going to work this out? Uh, so what they do is they take a mirror, and they hang it from a, a, masa, a masakaki tree, as it says right here. They hang it from a tree so that when later, this is so Amaterasu gets curious. Amaterasu thinking this whole like thing that they're doing outside strange, she, she cracks, uh, opens a crack in the door of the heavenly rock cave and says from within, because I've shut myself in, I thought that the plane of high heaven would be dark and the central land of the reed plains would be completely dark. Why is that Uzume, heavenly woman with hairpiece, sings and dances, and all the 800 myriad deities laugh? And so she looks out through this crack, and she seems to, and she thinks she sees another sun. What she's actually looking at is a mirror reflecting herself, because she's the sun. So she thinks she sees another sun, and the other heavenly deities say to her, like, oh, we got another sun. It's very nice. <laughs> it's very, very nice. It's, it's, better, it's just as good as you. And this is how they, they trick her to, to come out. And it says here, right at the, the end of this bit, when Amaterasu, when shiny heaven came forth, the plain of high heaven and the central land of the reed plains naturally became light. At this time, the 800 myriad deities deliberated together and imposed on Susano a find of a thousand platters of restitu restitutive goods. That's a hard word to say. In addition, they cut off his beard and the nails of his hands and feet had him exercised and expelled him with a divine expulsion. So, because of what, so they get Amaterasu to come back out, but they don't let Susano off the hook. He is expelled from the plane of high heaven um, and is forced to wander the, what is called the reed plane, which is what we know as just good old fashioned, normal, ordinary reality. So when he's out in the reed plane, he encounters, so 
so we're following along in our oh yeah i forgot to mention um susano and amaterasu also have a third counterpart so the, the way the three of them were created is izanagi uh he after the whole sh shebangle with um izanami and the the land of yomi he cleanses himself in a river and he wipes amaterasu from his left eye he wipes susano sorry no tsukuyomi the the moon god so the sun goddess from his left eye the moon god from his right eye and susano is wiped from his nose so susano is literally izanagi's boogers maybe that's why he's so mad <laughs> uh okay so oh one interesting one important aspect that i forgot to to note about this story regarding the mirror is that sort of there are three um imperial treasures that the 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 descendants of the yamato supposedly possess to this day no one has actually seen them there's no like documented evidence of their existence but they the imperial family claims they still exist so we got three things we have a mirror it's a magic mirror we got a sword, specifically a tsurugi, which is different from, like, if you're thinking of, like, a traditional, like, Japanese, like, katana, um, traditional Japanese sword, it's different, it's straighter, it's um, more like a Chinese dao. Uh, no, not a dao. What is the other one called? Um, a jen, I think it's called. Um, anyway, I don't remember. I don't, I don't know Chinese swords. Ah. <laughs> uh, anyway, so it's, it's, it's a very different kind of sword. Um, so there's a sword, there's a mirror, and then there's a jewel, and these are the three imperial treasures. And so we get a story. We don't, we don't read you, in your selections. You don't have the one for the jewel, but you do have the one for the the sword and for the mirror. So for the mirror, it's this bit where they trick Amaterasu out of the cave, and the sword comes from a, another very famous episode of Kojiki, and that's the. Um, Susano's encounter with the eight-tailed serpent. So there's this eight-tailed serpent, otherwise known as the Oroch, that is um, causing all sorts of problems. And so there's this woman crying, and Susano comes up to her. No, no, sorry. Um, the, there's a family. There's a, um, a father and a mother who have lost eight of their daughters, and they only have one left. And there are eight of their daughters. No, sorry. I'm trying to remember this correctly. So no, they had originally had eight. Uh, we'll just read the story. They explain it. <laughs> we originally had eight daughters, but the eight-tailed serpent of Kosh came every year, uh, has come every year and eaten them. We are crying because it's now time for him to come again. Susano asked, what is his appearance? Rubbing Bee replied, his eyes are like red ground cherries and his body has eight heads and eight tails on his body, grow moss and cypress. So there's this magical creature. It's a monster. You know, this is, you see this in myths all the time. Monsters. The hero god fights the monsters. You know, this is not a new thing. So he comes up with this clever strategy of like, ha of cre actually, there's a, I have a picture of this. So here we have Susano. So here's the, the, the woman that he ends up protecting. Here's her, her parents who, who he meets initially. So he comes up with this idea. Uh, so the monster has eight heads. So he fills eight subo, eight pots full with liquor with booze um the eight heads drink the eight booze and the the oroch the the also gets drunk here here the serpent's already been killed you see his heads cut off and after cutting off the heads of the the, the eight drunk heads of, of the serpent susano pulls out this sword right here the, the so-called grass cutting or grass mowing sword the kusanagi no tsurugi this is the second this is the sword of the the imperial treasures another very famous episode here he is doing his ragey thing um this is not accurate if you read the text you'll you'll if you've read the text you'll remember that the heavenly deities before they expelled him to the reed plane cut off his beard uh he has a beard here he shouldn't have a beard it should be shaved but you know whatevs <laughs> Uh, and then the other thing that I, we should note about Susano and, well, specific, more specifically, Shiny Heaven herself, Amaterasu, is that, so getting back to this question of like sort of the line of descent, her grandson is this guy who kind of just gets passing mention in the text. His name is Ninigi, right here. 
And then supposedly Ninigi is the grandfather of the, the legendary first emperor of Japan. This guy who may or may not have existed. There's it's complicated sort of, sometimes he's referred to as the pseudo legendary first emperor because there probably was a first emperor, but whether or not it was this guy is unclear. Anyway, he's usually referred to as Jimmu. And so here we see the sort of the, the connection between the, the sort of the, the generation of immortals, the gods, the kami, and finally we have connected them down to the mortal emperors who, you know, create the imperial line that exists to supposedly exist to this very day. So the last bit from the text that I want to cover is um, our, our great boy. And again, the, the third in the impatient, ragey dudes, <laughs> um, Yamato Takeru, which is usually just referenced, referred to as Prince Yamato or Yamato the Brave, I believe is, is how they translate Takeru here. You guys can skip this part. I don't like the sea dragon story. Anyway, here we go. Yeah, Yamato the Brave. So Yamato, so uh, he was originally called like a giant mortar, like as in a mortar and pestle. So like the, the, the mortar meaning like the bowl that you grind stuff in. He that's that was his original name was Prince Big Mortar. <laughs> um and then Prince Osu becomes uh, Yamato Takeru no Mikoto, or Prince Yamato the Brave, as, as, he, as you see here. So what is important about his story? So there's really, I mean, I, really, I highly suggest you guys read it because he's another fantastically crazy character in the text. Um, but there's really two things that you should get out of this. Um, first is like something that we've seen before, that we've talked about before, is this idea of sort of like, the Japanese nation state expanding through a series of conquests and assimilating the peoples that are encountered. Now, we talked about it previously from more of an anthropological standpoint, how that happened like with the, you know, the, the Jomon peoples and then how they were supplanted by the Yaoi and how the Yaoi sort of became the foundation for, you know, the current Japanese ethnic polity. Um, but here we get sort of a mythological version of that. So the, the, all of the stories about Yamato Takeru, um, Prince Yamato, center around sort of going somewhere to su subdue some savage or uncivilized peoples. And so the first story you get here is when he goes to Kumaso and he has a, it was a big fight with them and it's awesome. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's just, it's really great. So, and, you know, he's superhuman. He does all sorts of, you know, great stuff. When he arrived at the, at the house of the Kumaso Braves, he found that the home was surrounded by three rows of warriors and that they were building a pit dwelling. Remember, a pit dwelling. So this is an interesting sort of um, archaeological anomaly. Not even an anomaly, but it's sort of, it's remembering an earlier aspect of sort of the ethnic composition of the Iowa. Because if you recall, these sort of lower pit dwellings were characteristic of the Yaoi, of the early Yaoi. And so it's thinking back to sort of this, these earlier generations of um, Japanese cultural development. At the time, there was a great deal of noise about the coming feast to celebrate the new pit dwelling, and the food was pre being prepared. Walking around the vicinity, he waited for the day of the feast. When that day arrived, he combed his hair down in the manner of young girls and put on the upper garment and the skirt of his aunt. Okay. Completely taking on a young girl's appearance, he mingled with the women and went into the dwelling. Then the two Kumaso braves, the elder and the younger, looked with admiration at this maiden. So they're getting really hot for Yamato Takeru. So... This is another, this is a complete aside. This is not a major theme you need to remember, but I find it interesting that sort of, this is the first instance of you'll see something throughout Japanese culture, you know, cross-dressing of various kinds. It's the first example, as far as I know. So then they see him, elder and younger, looked with admiration at this maiden and had her sit between them as the festivities continued. Then, when the feast was at its height, Prince Little Mortar, this is Yamato, took his sword from his bosom and, seizing the older Kumaso's collar, stabbed him clear through the chest. Heart, this dude's hardcore. And the younger Kumaso, seeing this, was afraid and ran out. Yes, because of you know, the psycho, like, cross-dressing <laughs> guy who's sitting between you suddenly kills your brother probably run away. 
So he runs out, pursuing him to the foot of the stairs leading out of the pit dwelling. He seized him by the back, took the sword, and stabbed him clear through from the rear. Now, I didn't actually look this up in the the Chinese or the original text, so I don't know if rear means just from behind here or if it literally means like through the butt. I think it just means from behind. Then the Kumaso brave said, do not move the sword. I have something to say. <laughs> the prince gave him a respite while holding him down. When asked, who are you, my lord? And the prince replied, I am the son of emperor, really long name. <laughs> O Tarashiko Shiroake, who dwells in the palace of Hishido and rules the land of the eight islands. Again, the land of the eight islands right there. So that's, that's the Yashima. And my name is Prince Yamato Oguna. Hearing that you, Kumaso Braves, were unsubmissive and disrespectful, he dispatched me to kill you. <laughs> and so here, so this is the like, you know, Yamato Takeru sort of is sent all over the place to to kill off these these peoples and subdue them and to sort of bring them into the fold of the the nation state, I guess is what you could say. Um another thing I want to so okay, it's on page 29. So here here we get mention of our good friends the the Emishi. So no one really knows who the Kumaso are supposed to be, who like that refers to. Um, the only ones that are mentioned in the Kojiki that correspond to actual peoples that we know of are the Izumo, the people of Izumo, and the Emishi. And it says here in this bottom paragraph, from there he proceeded and subdued all of the unruly Emishi. And so this, here we get sort of like a mythological version of an actual historical event that happened in the 8th, 8th century. And so that's like that war, that, that sort of fight, with the emishi in the east is literally happening at this moment or not not the not the major civil war but definitely the like process of subduing them is currently happening at the time that this text is compiled then on his way back to the capital he arrived at the foot of the pass of ashgara and just as he was eating his travel rations the dd the pass assuming the form of white deer came in so then he took a piece of hidu plant left over from his meal and struck the deer, hit the deer's eye, and killed him. Again, so continuing the theme of he's just an aggressive, ragey asshole. <laughs> just, like, just like Susanol. Yay! But um, this, so this subdued here is, is interesting. I mean, maybe you guys won't find this interesting, but I find it interesting. So th the verb used is kotomuku. So the, the muku part literally means to face or be in the direction of. And then the koto here is like speech or a statement. So it's like to be in the direction of a statement is what it literally means. Um, to be facing in the direction of a statement or leaning towards a statement. Um, but what that means sort of metaphorically is this idea of sort of like making someone speak their subjugation to you. In other words, it's not just... The conquest is important, but it's also about sort of like forcing, this is the assimilation part, and this is why I think it's important, it's like forcing them to admit to their own subjection to you as the more powerful sovereign or whatever. I mean, this is kind of beside the point if you're largely achieving this conquering through force, but sort of there is that underlying sense of it's like compelling someone to admit that they have been subdued. Just kind of wacky when you think about it. Um, so the last thing I want to leave you guys with in regards to um, Prince Prince Reiji, Prince Reiji guy, Yamato Takeru, is so that sword that I mentioned earlier, the, the Kusinagi no Tsurugi. So after he gets his name, Yamato Takeru, and he's, he is sent into the east. This Did I skip the grass cutting? I wish I didn't actually include this in my notes. But the the reason why it's called, I mean, at the point, at the time when, uh, oh yeah, okay, it was above that. So his his aunt, Princess Yamato, none of these people have interesting names. So we so like, and it's just the name of the clan too. It's like just Princess. Princess America, <laughs> Prince America and Princess America. Okay. 
Um, she gives him a sword. On his departure, Princess Yamato gave him the sword. Kusanagi, grass feller. So kusa here is to is, is grass or like reed plants. And then nagi just means to mow or to cut down. So the grass cutting sword or the grass mowing sword. So she gives him the sword. And but the reason why it's called that, and I, it's, I mean, so this is this is weirdly, this is one of these things that you see in a lot of mythological stories where like the name of something ends up preceding, preceding the moment where it's actually named that. Because then we get the story of how it came to be named. And that's in Sagamu. So the governor there deceives him and he, he forms this elaborate plot to try and like kill Yamato Takeru. He lures him to this lake and then he lights all the fields surrounding the lake and hoping that it will you know, burn up. Um, so then what happens is he says, then first he mowed away the grass with his sword. Then he lit a fire with a fire striking implement that he found in this bag that he was given. And so he uses the sword to cut the grass around him and then he lights a counter fire I don't actually know what this is, but that's what the text says. He lights a counter fire, and then that fire burns up the men, and then he went back out and killed the governor and all of his clan, because as we may or may not remember, Yamato Takeru is not only the ragey guy, he is also superhuman, and he just kills the entire clan. Then he set fire to them and burned them. Today the place is therefore called Yakizu, the Burning Ford. So in other words, we have another one of these sort of ideological myths. It's like, you know, this place is called this because this um, murderous psychopath <laughs> killed an entire family and burnt them to the ground. Therefore, we call it the Bernie place. All right. So that's it for um, our discussion or my, my lecture on the, the Manyoshu. Sorry, on the Kojiki. Next up is the, the Manyoshu. And so I will be back here in a bit with that. So stay tuned. <laughs>